All right, welcome. Uh, I guess I'm interviewing myself, so let me ask, who am I? <laughs> um, such a pleasure to be here in Bangalore again, particularly since this is the home of my Guruji, the late, great U.R. Anandamurti, who I've known since 1986, when he was a professor at Iowa, at the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop. And I was an eager, really uh, ignorant young student, and he took me under his wing and taught me everything. He taught me to see. So over the years, I've been coming to Bangalore and Mysore to visit uncle, as I called him, and Esther auntie, his wife, there she is, and uh, the whole family. So it's, it's really a pleasure and a privilege for me to be uh, in the city where my guru lived. Um, let's see, what shall we talk about today? Maybe I'll begin by uh, doing a short reading of a book that I've... Um, uh, came out with last year. You know, I've been thinking a lot about cities, as you know. Um, I write about cities. Um, Bombay and New York, and Paris and London. Um, I like cities because I like people. It would be, I would be an extremely unhappy man if I didn't like people, uh, because, I'd, you know, I'd be like Charo or Rousseau or someone running off to the countryside, but the country isn't my thing. Cities are. Um, I've been, become very interested in the topic of migration because I am one myself. Um, if you'd like to know what I've been thinking, the current issue of an American magazine called Foreign Policy has an essay that I've written about migration. It's called, the title is This Land is Their Land. And it's my story of my family's story of uh, being migrants now for over a hundred years. Um, and the reasons that people migrate. You know, as I started looking into this topic, there's no issue which is filled with greater hypocrisy right now and which makes me angrier than the hypocrisy, the sanctimony that the West particularly has around the issue of migrants. Why are these people moving? They're moving because the rich countries, you know, came to our countries and basically stole everything. Uh, my grandfather, who left rural Gujarat in the 1920s for Nairobi, and then lived in Nairobi, and then lived in, um, in London, where my uncle was living. So he, he was telling me about this time when he was in a park uh, just outside of London. And an elderly Englishman comes up to him and sits down on the bench next to him and points, the Englishman points his finger at my grandfather and says, why are you here? Why don't you go back to where you came from? Why are you here? And my grandfather said, because we are the creditors. You have come to my country and you have stolen all our diamonds, our gold, our treasure, our minerals. And so we have come here to collect. We are the creditors. So I often feel this way about migrants from anywhere, not just India. Why are Mexicans moving to the United States? Because the Americans buy their drugs and sell them the guns to kill each other. So if you're a young Mexican or Salvadoran or Honduran, basically all you, the only choice you have is to move north. And what you have to offer isn't guns. The migrants aren't going to these new countries to invade, to loot, to rape, to steal. They're going there to work as dishwashers, as nannies, as computer techs. Um, and so anyway, uh, the, the articles uh, pretty strong, not an apology, but a declaration of our right to travel across the world. Um, so in this book, uh, The Secret Life of Cities, there's, there's a section about storytelling and storytelling and lies. 
One way that the poor get around the rigor of the law is, th is through subterfuge or embellishment. I like gossip and I like lies. Gossip because it helps you see the person whole and lying because it is an elevated form of storytelling and storytelling puts the people back into cities. This is what novelists tra traffic in after all, gossip and lies. It's not fake news exactly, it's another kind of... Tolstoy, Flaubert, Garcia Marquez, gossip mongers all. Did you hear about that scandalous Anna K? Threw herself in front of a train, yes, cause she thought her boyfriend was gonna dump her. Where does the truth lie? I grew up in the India of the 1970s, where buying a car was no simple thing. You had to register for a car for years, and when the lucky day came, you felt blessed, literally. I remember when my family in Bombay got lucky enough to be allotted a small fiat. The first thing we did was to take it to the temple and perform a car puja. We put sindoor on it, waved lamps around it, and broke a coconut on its hood. And then we took pictures of it and sent it to my grandparents in Calcutta to prove that we were well set in Bombay. It was important that we had documentary evidence of our success. All migrants, having forsaken family and friends in order to move, then face a mighty task, convincing the family and friends in the homeland that it was worth it. Their standards are high, that tests stern. I have a young Bangladeshi friend in New York whose parents have a Mercedes Benz parked in the driveway of their small, simple home in a working class neighborhood of Queens. All those who come to their home must, must first walk around the Benz. They bought it with the first savings they made in America, $7,000. What kind of Mercedes can you buy with 7,000 bucks? I asked my friend. Does it even run? It runs all right. So what's the catch? What's wrong with it? Well, he said, the wipers stopped working a while ago and we can't afford to buy new wipers because they cost 200 bucks each. So what do you do when it rains? Before we drive anywhere, we always check the weather forecast. And if it rains while you're driving, we always keep a subway map in the glove compartment. If it starts raining, we park it and get into the nearest subway and come back for it after it stops raining. The Benz is practically useless for the family, but it serves a higher function. It communicates to the people back in Dhaka that the family is well set. And sending back pictures or videos of the family standing around the Benz is not subterfuge, not exactly. Yes, it's true that my friend's parents have retired and his sister has recently lost her job in a food magazine and my friend will have to turn over half of his paycheck to help his parents meet the mortgage. So the image symbolized by the Benz may not reflect the true reality of their precarious situation, but for them it's a necessary deception. A Rwandan teacher of French in the New Jersey public schools named Jean Gratien tells me about the necessary deceptions practiced by Rwandan immigrants in the Netherlands, where he used to live. The state gives them money to buy things such as furniture. But they buy the cheapest furniture and save up the money for a round trip trick at home and props for a story. They wait for the summer and buy an expensive suit for themselves and the most impressive shoes, boots made of crocodile leather. The airports of Europe in the summer are filled with these returning African migrants garbed in extravagantly expensive shoes. What distinguishes the poor from the rich? It's a question I had been asking myself since my childhood in Bombay. Who lived in these flats and who came here to serve them? Who was rich and who was poor and how could you tell? Not from the clothes, not then, not even less now. Uh, because so many of them were handed down from the residents' children to their servants. Maybe the complexions, the poor were darker. But then what about the swarthy South Indians in technology? Footwear, explained my friend Jerry Pinto, who'd grown up poor but now gives tuitions to the children of a rich and is now a prize-winning writer. The difference between the, the rich and the poor in Bombay, said Jerry, is that the poor's feet are comfortable. The rich wear shoes 
tight dress shoes, high heels. The poor wear sandals, rubber slippers. Their feet breathe but give them away is poor. So the Rwandan migrants on their trips home buy the most expensive boots they can buy to prove to the unshod relatives back home that they've made it. When they get home, they rent an expensive car for two weeks. The first morning home, the people of the family, of the village, gather around the migrant to hear stories of the new land. The migrant in his fancy clothes, new shoes, big car, tells them what a big man has become in Rotterdam, in Paris, in Berlin. I am selling a story, Jean Gratien explains. I elaborate, I make up things. But the story doesn't earn anything for his family. It, in fact, it costs them money. His mother cannot refuse to make small loans to her fellow villagers while he's there, because after all, her son is a big man in America. Then the migrants go back to the cold countries, where the only time they're in a car is when they're making deliveries. The stories of the exiles, shoes and cars recruit new migrants. They're not the whole truth, and they're not all lies. These stories can afflict the people who listen to them in all kinds of ways. A man I met once in Delhi told me about his cousins in Kentucky. Every summer in his childhood, the cousins would visit his family in Delhi, and the family would drop everything to host their American relatives, taking them here and there, preparing the choicest meals, sleeping in the living room so that the visitors could rest undisturbed in the bedrooms. The cousins regularly sent over photos of themselves in front of their bungalow, which means villa in the Indian context, not a one-floor cottage as it does in America. Photos of themselves with their arms around their large new television or lying on the hood of their large new car. When the man from Delhi grew up, he got a chance to visit his cousins in Kentucky for the first time. He was expecting them to live like millionaires when he finally got to their fabled home in Kentucky. He started screaming obscenities at his cousins. He saw their bungalow, the shabbiest on the block, their ordinary car, and saw that they lived at a much lower standard than his own family in Delhi, who had been made to feel impoverished every time his cousins visited. All his childhood, he had felt deprived because of this lie. He howled out his abuse at the Kentucky liars. So that's a little section about storytelling and a life, thank you. Um, and, you know, I've been thinking about what we do as writers. There's all this talk about fake news, both in India and in America. Um, you know, what is it that we're doing? Do we, can we change anything? We're all gathered here you know, tens of thousands of us. It's an impressive group by any standards. Uh, India is a country hungry for books, uh, readers. Um, I remember the, the Gujarati literary issue, Akhandanan, which when I was growing up, the Diwali issue would, sa would sell in the lakhs of copies, which is unimaginable for any literary magazine in America. Um, so what is it that writers do? And I think the best answer comes in a poem by the great Russian poet Anna Akhmatova. She talks about, uh, she's got this great poem um, called Requiem. And the beginning of it, it's called Instead of a Preface. And it's a story that Akhmatova tells. She was the greatest poet of um, Russia during the Stalin years. And her books were banned all over the country. Um, so people recited her poems to each other. They were passed down orally, like the Vedas. Um, so she, she says, in the dark days of the Yezov terror, she and uh, thousands of other women would go to Siberia and stand once a month in front of this giant prison where their men were held. So there was Akhmatova and all these women, and inside the prison were Akhmatova's husband and stepson, and all these men, and, and the guards would call out the names of the women as they were allowed in 
to the prison to visit the relatives. So she was standing there in a huge crowd of women in the freezing in the Siberian uh, plain. And she says, an old woman, lips blue from the cold, heard her name, Akhmatova's name, called out. And recognizing the name, comes over to Akhmatova and points to the prison, the situation, and says, and she says, she spoke in whispers, because everyone spoke in whispers then. She asks Akhmatova, can you describe this? And Akhmatova says, yes, I can. And she says, the ghost of a smile passed over the shadow of her face. So that's all the old woman needed to know. Not so much that things were going to change, that Stalin was going to go, but that she, Akhmatova, a writer, could describe this. Bear witness. So I think that's, that is our dharma as writers. In these incredibly troubled times, both in my birth country and in the country of my residence now, in the present emergency, I want to describe this. I'll take questions now from anyone like. Hi, uh, what's your view on India refusing immigration to Rohingyas? I just got asked that question earlier today by uh, an interviewer for a newspaper. Um, you know, it's, it's shameful. During the Bangladesh war, we took hundreds of thousands of Bangladeshis. Indians themselves go all over the world. There's about 100 million Indians who live outside India in countries that have given them refuge often during politically troubled times. Uh, um, what's happening with the Rohingyas is a fast motion genocide. And it's incredibly disappointing to us writers, particularly to see Aung San Suu Kyi behave the way that, that she's doing. Uh, you know, we, we are obliged, India is obliged under international treaties to take in refugees. But, like with all migrants, there are, there are political uses of fear. So look at what's happening all around the world. It's not, you know, this phenomenon isn't restricted to India or the United States. Where does this fear of migrants come from? And why is it so heightened now? If those Rohingyas had come in five or ten years ago, they would have been welcomed much more in the country. Right now, there's eight men, eight white men, who own more than half of the planet combined. So eight men own more than 3.5 billion human beings, their combined wealth. So all over the world, the rich are getting richer. There's a great book by the French economist Piketty, which explains why there is this steadily upward flow of capital. Um, so all over the world, the rich are getting richer. But the people in their own countries know this and are outraged and they're coming for the rich with pitchforks. The last American election, you know, one of the driving forces was this anger that the bankers in New York have accumulated so much of the country's wealth. But the rich are no fools. They didn't get to become so rich by being stupid. So what they've done is to channel the anger of the masses outward, away from them, and on to the newest, the weakest, the migrants. So there are groups all over in these countries which are organized uh, by very powerful, very rich people which demonize migrants with, with the willing and able assistance of the media. The horror stories that we read about the Rohingyas, about Muslims, about Bangladeshis, about you know, crime, uh, about uh, they're you know, outbreeding us, they're replacing us. These stories don't spring up spontaneously. They're, they're spread. So I think it's a disgrace what's uh, India's treatment of the Rohingyas, just as it's a disgrace the uh, Americans' treatment of Mexicans and Central Americans and Muslims.
Hi, uh, just sort of curiosity, do you uh, ever sort of track uh, what happened to some of the more fascinating characters whom you have met in some of your books? For example, the uh, uh, Shusena grassroots worker who went I, who led the mob against his close Muslim friend in Maxim City or uh, the guy who, you, who told you that Targoras are best for breakfast and uh, like, so do you actually keep a track of what happened to them over the years? I do, very much so. I'm going to Bombay next week and I'll be meeting several of the characters in the book. You know, that book, it took me seven years to write. So there was a review of my book, which was quite perceptive in Vogue magazine, which said about Maximum City, uh, this is less a work of journalism than it is a chronicle of evolving friendships. So most, but not all of the people in the book are still my friends. There are certain people in Bollywood who, uh, I won't name right now, who felt insufficiently praised in the book and, uh, uh, I can't say I'm friends with them now, but many of them, like the, uh, the Shiv Sena guy, you know, I go back, um, uh, you know, most of the times I go back to Bombay and I go to see how he's doing, and he's doing very well. He owns many flats, he's like a minor industrialist now. He's really used politics to advance in Bombay society. Um, uh, the person who eats targolas, uh, same sort of thing. He moved up from his, his Charlie, uh, as they call it, or you know, slums, as we might call it, into a building in Mallard. And he and his family, they all used to sleep in one shack, if you remember, seven adults in, in one room. Uh, there were four brothers. Four brothers bought four flats in the same building. And the, uh, when they first got the flats, all of them would still sleep in the same flats because they were uh, just used to sleeping together. But gradually, as they got wives, as they got children, they moved into different flats, and then the inevitable happened. The family had a huge falling out. Two of the brothers live in uh, the building, and two others have actually gone back to the Charlie. They've gone back to the slum area because they feel that they have much more of a sense of community over there. Um, the runaway poet, Babanji, that I talk about, uh, who was trying to be a poet on the streets of Bombay. He is now a um, hematologist in Kanpur. So he went back to the path of science and he writes to me now and then. And it's really wonderful that, you know, um, I still have all these friends in Bombay, you know, people of the book I call them, Kitabia. Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, I recently read somewhere that um, uh, under the list of, uh, you know, Books you should read before you die, Maximum City is there. Much better to read that book before <laughs> you die than after. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I've read that book and frankly speaking, like uh, it really made me understand the city of Mumbai. Thank you know, I, almost I fell in love with the city after going through your book. I just want to know that uh, are you planning to write on any other city on the same lines? Yes. So, for an ungodly number of years, I've been writing a book about New York. You know, I, after I finished the Bombay book, I said, there's no way I'm putting myself through that again. It took me seven years uh, and had a huge cost in my life. And I said, I am not writing about other cities. I'm now, you know, I'll turn to fiction or screenplays or whatever else. Uh, unless I'm very drunk. I got very drunk. And I signed a book contract to write a book about New York, which is really the only other city I want to write about. So for the last almost 10 years now, I've been writing a book about New York. And I'm coming to the end of that project, if there is a God. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about the New York book. Uh, there are bits of it which have been published in, in different publications. But a lot of it is about migration. So for example, there's the world of these African um, uh, asylum seekers, and a bit of it came out in the New Yorker. And, you know, I was interested in the storytelling around asylum, the stories that migrants have to tell in order to get into the new countries. Another chapter is about Raj Rajaratnam and Rajat Gupta and that whole group of Indian private equity people, who some of them who ended up in jail. So I spent an entire summer just hanging out with Rajaratnam uh, in his penthouse apartment in Manhattan, where he told me the whole story of his life, why he did what he did before he went to jail. 
Um, there's another chapter about um, a group of uh, 30 young women who have the city's most exclusive pot delivery ring, marijuana delivery ring. Um, and I went around with them as they delivered the marijuana, and it's a, an incredible example, uh, example of uh, unbridled American entrepreneurship and, and female you know, entrepreneurship. Uh, so I published that, a section of that in American GQ, if you'd like to read that section, and immediately sold the movie rights. The moment I started writing about white people, Hollywood came calling. Um, <laughs> And then most recently, all this summer, I've been going around with the uh, NYPD, the New York Police Department. So I put on a bulletproof vest and I go on patrol with them all over the five boroughs. And I jump out with them as they get to these crime scenes, as they arrest people. Um, and, and I read that chapter because it's a very fraught moment for Policing in America right now, there's several high-profile incidents of the police um, shooting unarmed suspects, which of course we in India are very familiar with. I spent years in Bombay. You know, I was actually invited to watch an encounter killing uh, in Bombay. And I'd sat in police stations and watched people getting tortured, but I drew the line there at the encounter because then I didn't know if the encounter killing was going to be staged for my benefit. Um, so, yeah, the cops are another chapter of it. And then what ties it all together, like Maximum City, is my own life in New York. Uh, my coming there as an immigrant at 14 and uh, getting an education, raising children. And it's really, uh, it's meant as a gift to my two sons, both of whom were born in Manhattan. Yes, uh, go ahead. As, as someone who writes about cities and tries to portray their culture, uh, and as someone who experiences that firsthand and then kind of portrays it out, uh, how do you know that the things that you are seeing is a symptom of the entire city or is representative of the culture of that city? It's not. I'm very clear. It, if you read my book, uh, early on in, in the first passage, I say, there are many Bombays. This is my Bombay. So I could never claim to be writing the definitive book about Bombay or New York. It would be ridiculous. I mean, there's, there are 20 million Bombays, right? So. Uh, each one has his own. What I'm writing about is, is my own experience, but I'm also doing things that most people don't do, like devote seven years of their lives trudging in the hot sun, uh, picking up stories. So, yeah, I'm pretty clear that you know, these, all these books are really an individual enterprise.